School Transportation Nation. Welcome back to the podcast. It's brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing. Our friends at Adroit and the Propane Education Research Council. We have a jam-packed episode. Lots of interviews going to dive into it with Mr. Ryan Gray, always editorial extraordinaire. But uh, before we get to that, our guests this week are going to be Daniel Hernandez, the COO of Adroit. He's also the VP of operations at Beacon Mobility. And we have our friend Stephen Whaley, the senior director of auto gas business development at the Propane Education Research Council. And man, three guests. Colby Stevens, Director of Transportation at Teton County School District Number 1 in Wyoming. Ryan, man, let's get to the headlines. we got to get to these guests, man. Absolutely. Yeah. So as we uh, prognosticated, Tony, uh, last week, the Federal uh, Communication Commission approved, drumroll, school bus Wi-Fi hotspots as a funding mechanism under E-rate program. So more federal funding, Tony. Huge, Ryan, huge. I mean, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 had a little over $7.1 billion that went to Wi-Fi for school buses, amongst other things, right? We had, I think, libraries, hotspots. But if you took advantage of that money, the problem was... How do you continually fund it after that money dries up, right? You got to pay for the data for this Wi-Fi. And a lot of people said, you know what? I'm not going to go after it because I can't reimburse the expense. Other people did it and, you know, maybe they found the money elsewhere. But here we are, E-rate. It is humongous. I Guys, I don't think you realize how big a deal this is. You basically now have funding in perpetuity for school bus Wi-Fi. We always talk about the school bus as an extension of the classroom. And I sat in on this, uh, this hearing, they were talking about it or, you know, the committee meeting and the people that were opposed to it, basically their argument is, is that the school bus isn't an extension of the classroom and kids don't learn on the school bus. They just goof off. You know, that's anecdotal, right? Like you're generalizing, but you know, they're saying you're, we're being fiscally irresponsible, but there were three yays and two nays. So the yays have it, Ryan. And here we are, E-rate funding for school transportation, hip, hip, hooray. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So uh, you're right. The Emergency Connectivity Fund, which ARP um, enacted, uh, that's set to expire uh, this coming May 2024. So going forward, um, immediately, School buses are now considered uh, an acceptable use of E-rate funds. Now, some things have to happen first. Essentially, the FCC's Wireline Competition Bureau. So that's what basically goes through and lists all of the approved services and devices. So they have to do a, a, a supplementary list that's open for public comment. An FCC uh, spokesperson uh, told me that in the coming, you know, days or weeks, this will happen. I had a, uh, we had a, actually a, an expert um, a legislative analyst for the Consortium for School Networking tell us that it could take a couple months. Hopefully not, um, but uh, basically they need to have a public commentary period to look at uh, the eligibility uh, services list, comment on those, and then everything would get finalized. Uh, the FCC did tell me that applicants would be subject to rigorous E-rate application evaluation. So, of course, you got federal funds, you got uh, additional hoops to jump through. Uh, They're going to track um, all of these projects. Now, it was kind of interesting, one of the dissenters last week, uh, Commissioner Brendan Carr, uh, he mentioned that uh, with the emergency connectivity funds, one of the concerns about um, opening up school bus Wi-Fi under E-rate was that he said that he didn't see much accounting um, or couldn't find it anyways under emergency connectivity fund. He's a commissioner with the FCC. I imagine they have some of that information. I'm reaching out to FCC to get some more um, data on you know how many uh, school buses are we talking about? How many devices? Um, we do know, according to the FCC, it's a, you know around eighteen hundred between eighteen hundred nineteen hundred dollars per school bus to outfit these hotspots with all the technology um, and and the uh, connections and whatnot. So going forward, uh, you know we'll be waiting with bated breath uh, to see 
what the wireline competition bureau does with its eligible services list, uh, the public comment period. And then, you know, when, uh, with the 2024 funding, uh, year, um, coming up, uh, FCC says that, uh, school districts will go ahead and be able to apply. Yeah, Ryan, I know we, uh, when we got off the call, we were like, all right, what session can we add to the TSD conference? And, you know, we already had a technology panel, so this is going to be another element of technology that we're going to talk about at the TSD conference, guys. So hopefully we'll have more information for you along the way as more comes to light. But always good stuff, Ryan, to see more funding pointed at the school transportation industry. It's very exciting. Uh, I just, I can't tell you guys how important this is. It's going to be great for kids, great for learning. Uh, We're going to see more data come out of this and uh, a lot more conversation here in the, in the near future. So look out for more of that. We'll, we'll keep you updated on stnonline.com. We've got a great story up. And before we turn that to the next story, Ryan, you got, you got something else to add, buddy? Well, I think one of the big takeaways is obviously the funding, um, but you alluded to it earlier where some of the dissenters were essentially not saying it, but saying it, that uh, school buses should be ineligible because they're not in the classroom. Um, here we have uh, FCC voting, approving, majority saying, yes, they are an extension of the classroom. Here's, you know, student transportation leaders out there Take note, um, if folks are telling you in conversations locally that school buses aren't an extension of the classroom, here's another thing to point to. Say, well, hold on a second. This is what FCC just ruled. This is why they ruled it. You know, we also have a, a, a bullying article coming out in the November issue in a couple of weeks uh, where we have a university professor and a head of the Missouri Bullying Prevention Group uh, talking about school buses and extension of the classroom. So just, you know, start really taking note of all these things and get this into your narrative. You know, that's one of the big takeaways aside from the, the funding. Excellent, Ryan. All right, Ryan, give us a little update on Ohio. If you guys remember, there was a rollover crash. We had injuries, uh, fatalities. Uh, Definitely, it is point a bright light on safety in the state of Ohio and the use of three-point safety belts is top of mind. And I know they were putting together a working group. I think you had an update for us, Ryan, on that? Absolutely. So October 12th, uh, Ohio had its third meeting uh, planned. I believe there's four, um, maybe a fifth one, but there's definitely four on the docket. Um, So uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, we looked at Safe Ride School, that connection to, to school busing, really the kind of the first part of the meeting talked about school design, school drop off zones. Um, Ohio has a has a program in place there to fund uh, site safety improvements, um, looking at, you know, traffic studies and um, basically, you know, looking at school bus safety, not only in terms of the seatbelts, although that's, again, why uh, Governor uh, Mike DeWine called this working group to look at the feasibility of adding seatbelts to school buses. Really, this working group, as we've reported uh, previously, is really taking trying to take a, a a holistic approach to student transportation. So again, looking at uh, the impact of traffic flows at school sites, um, on school bus drop off, um, looking at safe routes to school, of course, with, you know, kids uh, walking and biking. But, you know, one of the things that stood out to me was Joelle Magyar, who's the superintendent for Avon Lake uh, Schools in Ohio. She spoke about a pilot project uh, that the school district ran, installed uh, lap shoulder belts on two of the 36 buses that uh, the, the school district uses. Started in the fall of 2019, then COVID happened, kind of took a little bit of the wind out of their, out of their sails. We know that's like Tony, right? And then it, um, the program uh, started up again uh, with the, the following school year, um, and it ended uh, as of June 2022. Um, now they are uh, on those two buses. The seatbelts um, are optional. They were mandatory before under this pilot. And, and interesting, really uh, seemingly didn't have very good uh, experiences with the seatbelts. I know that a lot of the seatbelt advocates uh, will not be happy to hear that. Joel talked about how students in kindergarten through second grade, they struggle to get their seatbelts buckled. Um, the high school kids, so they, they run a couple tier routes. So you'd be have the, the elementary kids on, uh, 
earlier and then the high school kids later, apparently. Uh, the high school kids could not fit in the shoulder belts. They couldn't get three to a seat, which you know is no surprise, obviously, with the larger children. Also found that a lot of the students... They just wouldn't wear them, and they'd shove the the buckles into the into the um, seat bottom, so kind of between the seat back and the seat and the seat bottom, those cushions. Um, so, uh, you know, not great uh, feedback um, in terms of of their experiences. Uh, you know, a lot of questions were were asked and answered. Uh, they talked about retrofitting, which there, evidently there's a bill right now in Ohio that would look to retrofit all school buses with lap shoulder seat belts uh, to a tune of about you know over $300 million. That's what Melody Coniglio uh, said. She represents the Ohio Association for People Transportation on this working group. Uh, she mentioned it's about $24,000 to retrofit. Now, we know from the folks uh, at the seatbelt manufacturers that uh, it knew um, it's, you know, five to $7,000 per bus to install seatbelts. Um, and, you know, I've talked with a lot of folks um, over the years about this, obviously, the great debate. And one person I was talking to, former Fed, former National Association leader, told me that uh, he really thinks that eventually the OEMs need to look at making seatbelts just a standard uh, equipment uh, because at a certain point, um, some crash is going to happen and the liability, the lawsuit is going to be so high that some CFO somewhere is going to look at it and say, hey, look, it's just, you know, it's better that we just go ahead and put them on the bus to absolve ourselves of some of the liability. But we're not there yet. We still know that it's a, a, an option, uh, not standard. Uh, so um, until then, we're going to still have a lot of these debates. You know, I think <laughs> they will still continue long afterward. Um, it was interesting. Uh, Magyard uh, mentioned that the school bus drivers and transportation really made the decision to end the pilot and not make uh, the seatbelts mandatory. You know, apparently that the, the experience was that bad. You know, definitely looking forward to uh, to getting in touch with Avon Lake and getting more information on that pilot. Um, but interestingly, some of the discussion, no no comments about what happened with student behavior. No, no comments about that. Uh, Magyar didn't uh, mention that. There were no questions. Also, really no questions about enforcement. Um, so some of the folks that we've talked to, some of our articles have discussed that to really make seatbelts successful on school buses, you have to have some kind of enforcement program to get the kids to wear them. Now, there were questions about liability, absolving drivers. If Interestingly enough, though, we often hear you know, the liability if students aren't wearing them. There was a question from Davida Russell on the working group. She's a school bus driver, um, school bus driver rep on this working group out of Ohio. And she asked if, if drivers were absolved if the students wear them and something happens on the bus where they can't unbuckle, um, not the flip side of, you know, having a seatbelts on the school bus is kind of the, to the point of the uh, former national association representative that I spoke to of OEM saying, Hey, you know, this, again, this was his view of uh, that. They should say, Hey, it's, it's too costly not to have seatbelts on the buses. Uh, Russell was asking the opposite question. Are drivers absolved if students have to wear the seatbelts or are wearing the seatbelts and a fire happens or they can't get out? Um, so, uh, you know, definitely um, noted some, um, you know, opposition to seatbelts um, in Ohio. Uh, not surprisingly, um, you know, one of the things that we've tracked a lot of, Tony, is that, you know, there's certainly there are those state laws out there. But it really seems over the last several years, the trend to be more optional. If the school district um, looks at it, determines it's feasible, it's it's um, fiscally responsible, that they do it themselves, that they're the best ones with their community to make that decision. Um, and that certainly, at least from the, the October 12th meeting that I watched, that certainly seems to be where this is going in Ohio. 
Yeah, it's super interesting, Ryan. I mean, safety is paramount in school transportation. And, you know, everybody likes to hang their hat on the fact that school buses are the safest mode of transportation on the road. And it only helps to be safer. And uh, we need to make a concerted effort to really look at these sorts of challenges. I know also we talked a little bit about electronic stability control. And we had a story in the uh, upcoming issue on that in November. And this is kind of, to my point, where we had talked before with this accident, could the driver have recovered from that swerving if the bus had that kind of technology built in on it? I mean, we take it for granted in our passenger cars that that's on there, but it's not on all school buses. Now, new school buses, yeah, we see it, but there's a lot of old school buses without that technology. So it, it only puts a bright light on the importance of these types of technologies that improve driver safety, driver assistance technologies, which we're going to see more and more of, I think, downstream. We said that with mirrors, lane departure, sensor technology, backup. I don't know how I could back my car up without having a sensor telling me I'm too close, right? The days of old when I have like a rental car and I don't have that, I'm like, my God, how do I not live with this? Like, how did my life exist without that? You, it's just, you take it for granted. Um, these are all technologies that we see proliferate and we're going to see continue proliferate on school buses. Uh, but guys, you always got to consider these sorts of things is would the outcome have been different if this technology was present? And I think, yes. Yeah. And you know, Avon Lake, uh, Maggie mentioned, uh, in her presentation to the working group, their, her buses have electronic stability controls. Um, so that was just a, a reference made didn't go into any, uh, um, you know, uh, impacts of those or uh, positive uh, results, um, really focusing on the on the seatbelts. Um, but, you know, you're right. It, it, you know, there's all this technology now um, and kind of back to the comment made to me a, a while ago about from the OEM perspective, um, you know, certainly the OEMs, they're going to they're going to uh, provide what the, their customers want. Uh, within reason, right? But um, you know, at a, at a certain point, uh, as an industry, we have to look at everything that's available, and certainly, you know, look at the pros and cons. And that's what this working group is trying to do, um, and what every district should be doing, and every school bus contractor should be doing, right? When they're when they're making these evaluations. Uh, but if there's technology out there that can make the ride safer. Um, we have to at least look at that. Um, and, and sometimes some will make sense, some others won't uh, for whatever reason. Um, but as a whole, kind of, again, looking at that holistic approach, add all these things together, uh, as long as they don't result in unintended consequences, which is to the point of this working group, to the point of what Magyar at Avon Lake was talking about, um, then certainly, you know, the districts need to look at, um, you know, how could they install these technologies into their operations um, to, you know, further improve student safety. Excellent. All right, Ryan, we're going to take a break. We have a message from TransFinder. Well, the votes are in and STN Expo attendees have spoken. TransFinder was overwhelmingly selected as the best software and best hardware for 2023 at STN Expo in Reno, Nevada. Yes, you heard that right. For the first time ever, TransFinder received the Innovation Choice Award for best hardware. And for the second year in a row, TransFinder has won the best software award, adding to numerous past awards TransFinder has won for its software products. TransFinder's move into hardware was driven by client demand. TransFinder now provides the tablet, the mounts, the card reader, and more as part of its one partner, one solution approach. Guys, you can learn more by visiting TransFinder.com or calling them at 800-373-3609 or email them at getplus at transfinder.com and make sure you put STN podcast in the subject line. All right, guys, some great interviews lined up for you. I'm talking with Daniel Hernandez at Adroit Next. All right, School Transportation Nation, I'm welcome to the podcast. A new guest to the podcast, we're glad to have him, Daniel Hernandez of Adroit. He's the Chief Operating Officer and also the Senior Vice President over at Beacon Mobility. Daniel, welcome, my friend. Thank you, Tony. Very glad to be here. 
Excellent. So tell us a little bit about who Adroit is, what you do, how does Beacon Mobility play into us? Uh, Give me a little more color in that. Excellent. Yeah, well, um, you know, Adroit is uh, one of uh, the nation's uh, alternative transportation options for transporting students to to and from school. Uh, We've been in this space since 2017. And uh, it's been definitely a a very fun ride to support school districts uh, nationwide. Um, And around end of 2021, uh, Beacon Mobility came into the picture and uh, acquired Adroit just uh, around the end of uh, 2021. And the process of being part of uh, Beacon Mobility, being one of the um, largest student transportation services uh, in the yellow bus space, um, has been very uh, unique for for Adroit, being able to understand how the yellow bus operates and learn from you know people that have been in this space for uh, decades and uh, in improving and implementing new uh, safety uh, structures and techniques for Adroit has been tremendous. So yeah, we're we're very pleased to be part of Beacon and uh, continue this this journey of uh, serving school districts across the the country. And then, you know, Adroit as a company, you're specializing in moving McKinney Vento students, special needs students. Obviously, we've seen the advent of the use of non-yellow transport in a much bigger way. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, what problems are you solving for school districts? What is that kind of, when they come to you, they're like, Daniel, we got this challenge. Like, how does Adroit solve that? And what does that look like? Absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's not a secret that nationwide we're, we're experiencing a, a tremendous uh, um, size of uh, shortage of drivers. And um, the biggest question is, can alternative transportation supply, right? Uh, even in this space, uh, multiple uh, customers reach out saying that even alternative transportation companies are falling short. So um, Adroit has a very unique approach. Um, we operate in most of the states with the transportation network uh, license, which is a TNC license, as well as a brokerage service. So we either contract drivers directly with Adroit or we contract with transportation services within those states, which allows us to have a bigger reach uh, for a driver pool. So where even alternative transportation companies fall short, Adroit has a very robust driver uh, supply that has been um, supplying districts with a bigger opportunity to transport uh, a higher population. So when you ask uh, Tony about, you know, what do we do different or um, how, how are we supporting the, the biggest approach is making sure that every single student can go to school. So whether if a student's on a wheelchair or a student needs a specific um, harness or a divider in the car to, to ensure the safety of the student, a droid provides all of those services if a student uh, needs a, more of a one-on-one approach, if you need a monitor or an aid or an attendee in the vehicle, that's something that Adroit also supplies, which is big. You know, um, more and more uh, we run into the need of one-on-one support for some of the students, and uh, and that's where we thrive. Just making sure we can customize the product for our our clients and and deliver something unique. So that's that's been the approach for mainly special needs, right? For McKinney Vento. Um, our technology has been big, right? So being able to create a product that can be uh, very flexible, very um, customizable and allowing our clients to change the the routes if needed, last minute students being added and removed. So um, technology has played a big factor in, in this approach. Yeah. So talk a little bit more about the technology, right? So I, I've seen your ads running in STN magazine and there's a phone and you see the vehicle on the road driving its route. Who sees that, right? Does the parent see that? Is that the administration of the school district? Like who has access to visibility on your technology platform and how does that work using companies that would be a network company versus your own? Like how does that all kind of work together? Absolutely. So technology in, in, in this day of time, it's, um, it, you have to provide visibility for all the stakeholders. So uh, parents definitely have access to the app so they can see uh, live uh, GPS tracking. They can see exactly where their vehicle is at all times. Um, at the same time, school officials have a portal 
which allows them to also track the vehicle live. Um, sometimes uh, when when you talk about a portal, it's mainly for data, right? No, but in our case, they have a full monitoring system. They get live notifications as well. Um, they can see everything from invoicing, from student data, adding a student request forms. It's just our goal with technology, Tony, is to facilitate and alleviate the load for school districts, right? Uh, often we talk about just driver shortage, but it's also staff shortage. You know, we see, uh, you know, directors of transportation or special education uh, directors struggling to have a full staff in office. So supplying them with the technology that allows them to onboard a student quicker, um, it, it, it's, um, it's tremendous. So, so we leverage the technology to allow visibility, to improve safety, and to make sure that, you know, every student has the opportunity to go to school. So the drivers um, are constantly tracked and the drivers have the app, the parents have an app, the school officials have a portal, and uh, even this, the teachers at the school sites are able to, through an iPad, because, you know, these days most teachers have an iPad, they can also track the vehicles. And if a student or a ride is it's going late due to traffic or whatnot, they can take this group of students into the classroom and then come back to pick up the other one once the student is outside. So let's talk about safety as well, because this is kind of a, a bigger thing, right? You You guys are putting students in vehicles, What's your process of onboarding these companies, working with them, the quality of the service being provided? How does Adroit take a real active role in safety? So this is actually a, a very good question, Tony, uh, which is the, the, biggest, the biggest question everybody asks, even, even Beacon Mobility in the process of, of uh, looking into Adroit. So um, th- the first thing, Tony, is understanding the type of population that we transport. Um, it's not just um, minors, right? We're transporting uh, a very vulnerable population. You know, some of the students are nonverbal. So you have to be able to ensure that they're going to be safe, even if they cannot communicate. So um, the, the biggest approach that we do is making sure that the drivers that are going into our platform are capable and understand the type of population and who we transport, right? So at that at that point, if we feel that that person is not ideal for the job, it's better to just you know not contract with them instead of just going through that. But of course, when you talk about the process, you know we go through background checks, you know FBI. So when you when you think about everything that a teacher goes through to ensure their background and their clearance, we do the same thing. So we give the, the schools and the parents the peace of mind that, you know, everything that your uh, child's teacher did to be able to be in that position, we do the same approach, right? Uh, when it comes to checking their background, right? On top of that, you know, we check the driving record. We make sure that they go through TV testing. We make sure they go through um, mechanical ins- inspections verified by the state, uh, not just an inspection done, done by a droid. So the approach of understanding first the population and then making sure that we have all the the steps in place to make sure that these drivers are qualified is very unique. And then on top of that, the training, right? Something that you're going to be seeing soon during the TSZ conference is uh, we're rolling out a surprise. Okay, I can't tell you much yet, but we're... Oh, I like <laughs> surprises, Daniel. You sure you don't want to share with us? I can't, I can't share it yet, Tony, but during the keynote speaker on Thursday morning, uh, we're going to be rolling out an initiative that is primarily addressing student safety, right? Making sure that everybody that's in the vehicle or soon to get on a vehicle will always be safe. So that's, that's one of the things. It's, it's coming up. So just uh, be sure to, to keep an eye on that on the keynote speaker. Thursday morning. Absolutely. We're looking forward to that. I like surprises. So I uh, can't wait for that. Uh, TSC conference is uh, November 15th through the 20th, guys. If you uh, haven't signed up, be sure and do that too. And uh, tscconference.com, check out that agenda that Daniel's referencing. Uh, they are sponsoring uh, one of our keynotes. So thank you to Adroit for that. And uh, Daniel, can you talk about the customer experience at Adroit a little bit? Tony, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, at Adroit, uh, our uh, customers and our clients are the biggest thing. And uh, four years since the inception of Adroit, uh, the customer experience has been our main priority, uh, not only the, you know, for our clients, but for every single person involved. So the parents, the students, the drivers, just to make sure that we can provide a product for every single person involved. So we take pride on giving that customer experience 
to our clients and everybody involved. Daniel, talk to me a little more about how can people find out more about Adroit? How can they learn about what you do, your service? How can they talk to your team to get a little more information on, you know, to see if this is the right fit for them? Absolutely. So, you know, everybody can go to our website. It's uh, www.goadroid.com. And um, they can you know, see our services. I think one of the, the best things coming up is just visiting our booth. We're going to be in booth 704 at the TSC conference. Uh, we have a 20 by 20. We're going to have a full staff there. We're going to you know, make something fun for everybody who attends, but uh, mainly just to understand how we can approach their transportation needs and supply. One, one interesting factor, Tony, is... Often school districts don't even realize the need or the opportunity that they have by just uh, diversifying their uh, driver pool, right? So, you know, uh, th- this approach helps even uh, school districts that have a full in-house transportation, um, you know, operation, right? If you can diversify that um, portfolio of having, look, alternative services as well as the in-house transportation has been a proven factor that allows directors to have some more freedom on their fleet, right? So, so that's what we what we can explain when they come to our booth. Wonderful. And then uh, your website again? It's www.goadroid.com. Wonderful, Daniel. Thank you for coming on. We look forward to seeing you soon at the TSC conference, and uh, can't wait for that big surprise. Uh, you guys, got to be there. All right. Thank you, Tony. Really appreciate it. And thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely. All right, guys, stay tuned. We got more interviews coming up next. All right, guys, want to welcome to the podcast a guest we've had before, a familiar face. We see him at STN Expo. We see him at the TSD Conference, Green Bus Summit. He's leading Lunch and Learns. It's Stephen Whaley, Senior Director of Business Development from the Propane Education Research Council. Steve, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Tony, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I am looking forward to to TSD coming up in Frisco next month, and uh, we're going to have a great time there with uh, uh, propane demo buses and riding drives, all the all the shows that uh, you you put on so very well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be a packed house, Steve. We got record-breaking attendance at the TSD conference this year. So, you know, you always like hearing that when you got a, a lunch and learn and a ride and drive. You're going to have to, to bring more people, man. It's uh, People are going to get excited about propane, I think, right? They, they are excited about propane. And we've got a lot of interesting topics out there to kind of delve into with you today. So the first one I wanted to touch on was we got a press release from Perk. And you guys were addressing an article written by this news outlet called Vox, right? So I took a peek at it because I had never heard of them before. And I was like, all right, why are they responding to this? And you look at the article and there's definitely provocative graphics showing, you know, black plumes of smoke and, you know, the effect of children. And it was kind of like, wait, are they talking about diesel or, and you dive deeper and they're talking about propane. I was like, well, clearly they maybe have never been on a propane bus or seen details. And so you guys took umbrage to that and you've, you decided to kind of send us a release to kind of respond to that. And, you know, Make the facts known. Do a little fact check. No, no fake news, right? So let's 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 put it out there. You know, want to talk to that a little bit for us? Sure. And and you know, when we get the kind of uh, response from from our industry and school districts who are who are looking at, you know, how, how can we displace our diesel buses? When it, when an article like this comes out, you know, we, we just have to respond with 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 facts, you know, with with math and science, and and, and so that's what we we did in a short, concise way to, to to make it known. But when you know when you when you try and portray you know propane as something you know actually dirtier than diesel, you know we. We have to respond. It's a reach, right? That's a huge reach. Yeah, it, uh, I mean, there's there's just simple common sense things, you know, because, you know, when, when people think of propane, they think of, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, cooking in, on, on my back deck. Well, if it's if it's so clean that we let it touch our food, um, doesn't it make a little bit of sense that it's going to be very clean burning in an engine that, that moves down the road too? Yes. And so, you know, you have, you have things like, you know, West Virginia University who uh, back in the day busted Volkswagen for their emission scandal. And so when, when they do a test of a, of a new diesel bus and a new propane bus and put them on the same routes with their mobile emission equipment and find out that, oh, wow, 
even though both of them meet the emission standards, propane's 96% less on those toxic emissions. I mean, that makes really good sense to look into, you know, that kind of a solution for what you can do for your kids, because it's all about displacing diesel buses, you know, you know, 490,000 buses out there, you know, we still have 180,000 diesel buses that are prior to year 2010. These are emission standards that go way back and that are horrific. So it's all hands on deck when it comes to, you know, what the EPA deems as clean energy, like electric school buses and propane school buses to displace as many of these diesel buses as we possibly can. So, you know, I mean, in, in, instead of, you know, picking on on propane, how about we pick on the 180,000 buses that need to be replaced and, and join forces in making this happen and getting the right information out in front of school districts? Yeah, I mean, I wrote an article in our November issue, my editorial letter, right, each month. It's, you know, it's basically using the iconic yellow school bus to our advantage. But the really the bigger story is, is it's famous. Everybody knows it. It's synonymous with education, childhood. There's a nostalgic feel that people have that they had this experience with a school bus, right? But the school bus of the past that your grandpa knew, which was the diesel spewing yellow box that's old and antiquated, a lot of the public still has the view that school buses have not innovated in the last 30 or 50 years. They look the same, but the insides are significantly different. Now, we know being in the industry, many of the buses out there have a very long life cycle, right? So the buses you're talking about, right? If people are keeping a 30-year bus on the road or a 25-year bus on the road, yeah, that they're only solidifying probably that view of a bus. But when you look at the newer technologies, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, we see a massive change. And I know you've seen that over the time with propane because propane came in. The, what, what year did propane energy enter the school bus market, Steve? In, in earnest with our with our new new technology, it was right around 2010, uh, 2010, 2011. Uh, there was a great partnership uh, of engine development technologies married to the OEMs of, of, of school buses. And, uh, and it was right around the same time when electric school buses came onto the market as well. And so both of them have been e evolving. We're on our fifth generation of, of propane engines and school buses now. And uh, uh, both of them came on about the same time today as of, as of today the, the polk data that you know has the registration of all school buses uh and their engine power units um we have twenty two thousand uh propane school buses that are in over 1100 school districts nationwide and you know if you look at the the typical replacement cycle for for, for vehicles especially in student transportation it's about 10% a year of your fleet gets turned over and you know ready for for new buses coming in and so in our time span we now have dozens and dozens and dozens of student transportation uh, districts that have now 100% propane school buses and that doesn't happen unless you have a solution that works. Now, I've, I've had a saying since since I got into the all fuel business, you know, about twenty years ago. If if you want to be environmentally sustainable, you have to be financially sustainable. Otherwise, it won't grow and you won't be able to make the biggest impact. You don't want to be a science project with uh, you know a, a, a new energy source that isn't going to be able to pay dividends to the user. You, you have to be cleaner. You have to be cheaper. You have to run just as well and just as far. And you have to have a lot of this energy source before you're going to have a real adoption of an alternative to, to replace this, you know, this monstrosity of diesel that's out there. Now, we've talked a lot about the movement of electric vehicles, right? So you just touched on it, is that we definitely see political mandates by states. We saw California come out with a zero emission move over the next 11 years to transition the state. We've seen New York. We've seen cities like Boston. And, you know, the big question that is always out there, Steve, is the infrastructure is just not there. The utilities just aren't ready to pull power to these sites. But 
propane's kind of coming to the aid of people to try to help with power generation. Can you talk a little bit to that and kind of what you guys are doing to help kind of bridge the gap here for people? Sure. It, it's It's been about a year now, but we have uh, three manufacturers who have really stepped up and been able to provide off-grid DC level three fast charging on the spot. We have we have mobile, which is you know trucks that are actually coming to places and, and charging vehicles. We have towable, uh, which is on a trailer and it's able to to go anywhere and set up you know temporarily or or long term. And then we have portable, which is on skids that are able to be dropped right in the middle of a parking lot. And you know this because we've done it at your parking lot ride and drives. And we're able to charge these EV vehicles with a very clean energy source that doesn't tax the grid. Uh, we're able to do this in, in some cases. We're able to do this in combining solar and wind along with that propane generation to give us three energy sources that are very clean to provide that EV level charging. And, and you know, because every one of those zero emission electric buses has emissions elsewhere. We're, we're, we're moving the target to the exhaust pipes of a power plant. And that power plant is burning fuels to create that electricity that goes through the transmission lines and has some degradation loss in the process. But we're really proud of these EV charging units that we're doing because they're on site, they're off grid, and it allows for an immediate solution. I was just on the phone with somebody yesterday in Georgia who had 10 EV buses delivered. And now they're being told by their, their power company, it's going to be another 24 months before they're going to have the power delivered to their facility. Uh, and, and so they were looking, hey, how can we make this happen? And so we're connecting the dots for folks and get them in, in touch with the technologies of propane EV charging to make that happen. We're, we're certainly not anti-electric. We want to help every energy source that has a, a, a school bus solution for getting folks off of diesel and onto something clean. Excellent. Now, the future of power generation has kind of shifted a little bit, too, because we've got uh, PSI, who's kind of off the board now for the propane side of it. And Roush is kind of the only game in town for Bluebird. But Cummins has been innovating a product, and I'm sure you're ready for it to enter the market. We, we've, we're, we're holding our breath, waiting. I think gasoline is the first iteration, to my understanding, of that product. But propane is not far behind with that Cummins solution. You want to talk to that a little bit? Sure, sure. Now, in in 2024, emission standards are changing and uh, NOx emissions are, are being drastically reduced by 75%. So all the diesel after treatment that you think is tough to deal with now is about to get a lot tougher. Uh, so there's there's alternatives with with gasoline and propane on the Cummins uh, docket coming up. Gasoline is going to come out first. Uh, they're able to meet that that emission standard. But in 2027, the emission standard drops again substantially. And that's the target date for Cummins, which uh, is going to provide that 6.7 liter uh, displacement engine. And, and by the way, not only does it it meets, it far exceeds the uh, the emission standards of 2020. 27. Uh, and, and by the way, our current engines today uh, are at 0.02 NOx. Now, the, the, the 2027 EPA and uh, uh, CARB harmonized to 0.035. Uh, so we're already cleaner than what EPA and CARB is projecting for student transportation and, and, and all transportation in medium duty vehicles coming up. Uh, but on the, on the coming side of it, that new engine is actually the lowest CO2 producing engine in the world. Uh, and that's that's off of uh, the, the the Cummins presentation that I that I did with them recently in uh, in Las Vegas. Well, exciting stuff coming from the propane industry. And uh, thanks so much for jumping on with us, Steve, and uh, giving us the lowdown, uh, you know, really giving us what's happening in the market, getting us a feel for that. And we really look forward to seeing you in Frisco, Texas at uh, the TSD conference, guys. That's the November 15th to the 20th. If you haven't registered, be sure to check it out. If you are going, make sure you put the uh, Perk Lunch and Learn on your schedule. You go to our daily agenda. Steve's buying lunch. Steve, I mean, what are we having? Steve, sandwiches, burritos? I don't know. Something delicious, I'm sure. Hey, we are We are going to lunch and learn. And, and we have three panelists that are actually uh, student transportation contractors 
a small, medium, and large from up north, down south, and in the middle of, uh, of, of our country so that you can get an idea of their experience because being a private contractor, you know, you're a little bit more, you know, interested in not just being environmentally sustainable, but being financially sustainable. And so they get to tell their stories of, you know, over $3,000, you know, a year per bus in fuel cost savings uh, compared to diesel, all with a quieter ride for their students and, and how it's working out for them, how they got started and how it's going and, and where they're where they're going in the future. So we'll have three of those as panelists telling their stories at the Lunch and Learn in TSD. Wonderful. And Steve, if people want to learn more about propane, where do they go? What's your website? We like to send people to betterourbuses.com. Uh, it, it focuses directly on student transportation and what those options are and how we can make it all happen. BetterOurBuses.com is is full of information to uh, uh, to provide students uh, and their parents and as well as school districts on what propane can provide them in a safe, clean, healthy ride to and from school. Excellent. All right, guys, that's BetterOurBuses.com for all those great resources about propane. Steve, thank you again for coming on, my friend. We'll see you soon. Take care, Tony. All right, guys, great conversation. We're going to continue the fun. We got Taylor Ekbatani and Colby coming up for a great conversation about what's going on in Wyoming. All right, Nation. So I have another exciting guest on the podcast with us. He's actually a rising star for this year. So if you haven't checked out the October issue, definitely head over there. You'll read about all 10 rising stars. But today we have Colby Stevens. He's the director of transportation for Teton County School District number one in Wyoming. So welcome, Colby. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Taylor and Claudia. It's great to be here. And I know you're actually uh, recording. We can't, you guys can't see Colby, but he's got a full setup. So his district has a podcast recording room, right? And you can rent it? Yeah, I think it's uh, headed up by our high school engineering department. It's at the local library. They've basically commandeered one of the meeting rooms and put up a bunch of sound equipment and just free to the public. So pretty nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So thanks for jumping on again. And like I said, uh, Colby's a rising star. So if you guys haven't read that, definitely check it out. But before we jump into it, Colby, I actually attended the University of Wyoming. So Jackson Hole is gorgeous. I mean, you have the Tetons right there, the beautiful mountains. I mean, it's got to be a pleasure to live right there. Oh, it, it's the reason I moved here for my wife and I for sure 12 years ago. It's gorgeous. It's a great place to live, a great place to drive a bus. Shameless plug. So, <laughs> <laughs> so where did you move from? Originally the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, wow. Okay. So decided Wyoming was, was the next place for you guys? Yep. Uh, similar to you, I had uh, visited Jackson Hole. It was kind of my first taste of the Mountain West. Fell in love, uh, found that every spare moment vacation was spent in this area. Um, and so uh, got married and, and uh, the pipe dream became a reality, I guess. Yeah. And you said 12 years ago, so you got, you started actually as a school bus driver. So what was that, you know, progression kind of like, and I'm assuming it was at the same district. Yes. Yeah. So I, I moved here and, um, just out of college, wasn't really quite sure what I wanted to do. So a friend of mine who had worked for the district here was like, Hey, you should come drive a bus. Uh, it's, it's part-time. Uh, you can do stuff in the middle of the day, you get benefits, all that kind of, I was like, Great. Sounds great. So I started driving a school bus here in 2011. And over the course of time, just, you know, did all the uh, field trips, activity trips, sports travel, different things. And um, then there was an opening up in the office uh, for our secretary. Actually, I took, I took that job, learned a lot of the administrative paperwork side. Um, then our router retired and I got his job. And then our director retired shortly thereafter. And so I was able in that span of time to sort of learn the ropes and learn a lot of the different aspects of the department and the district and sort of prepared me for uh, the role I'm in now. Yeah. So definitely seeing you said the different aspects, routing and, you know, the secretary position. So that's really cool to have that well-rounded perspective. Yeah. I think it really set me up well for a pretty, you know, you know it's a pretty steep learning curve in the industry. Um, and I think it it really set me up well um, to all of a sudden be overseeing uh, the entirety of the department. So, mm -hmm. and starting as a driver, you can also relate 
to the drivers as well. You know, you, you know what they go through, you have driven, you know, probably the same routes as them. So the weather conditions and everything like that, do you still have a CDL? Uh, I do by necessity. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm sh- most, at least most of the directors I talk to around the state, we, we've all got them. We've got to have them. And you don't want to have to be the last one to drive. And, um, but you always got to be ready for that. Mm-hmm. And I know, you know, one of the biggest challenges that you noted that we were talking about for the rising stars was the school bus driver shortage. And you kind of mentioned, you know, Jackson Hole is a revolving town, right? You have part time yes. people that live there. So I'm assuming during the winter, everyone, you know, flocks away. But, you know, how, what does that look like for the driver shortage? How are you guys kind of handling and navigating that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's been interesting. I mean, you know, I, the driver shortage isn't news. Uh, to anybody. I mean, everyone I talk to across the state of Wyoming is dealing with it. Um, I actually just checked Zillow this morning. Average home price in Teton County as of this morning is $2.25 million. Wow. Um, And that's about doubled since 2020. Even then was very expensive. So on top of that, we've got very seasonal, transient, kind of a revolving door type town because of the cost, uh, because of the recreational pursuits that people come, people go. And so we've found, we haven't solved anything, but we've definitely found that our target um, has to be established sort of longer term local residents. Um, it, it's hard for somebody to commute, you know, in somewhere more affordable to commute for a five hour a day job. Um, and it's also hard for somebody who's brand new to the area. They're, tr- they're trying to make as much, you know, as they can, to be frank and honest. So uh, what we've found is finding those people who are maybe former school district employees, um, semi-retired looking for insurance. There's a lot of small business owners who would love insurance for their family. So they take on a little route um, to get that those benefits for their family. We found those have been far and away uh, the most successful uh, sort of long-term drivers for us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what is with the college, you know, being in, in Laramie, are you getting any college students coming up to Jackson Hole that drive at all? You know, I'm just wondering if you guys are attracting maybe a younger population. Um, you know, we don't, I, I think just because it's just far enough, I mm-hmm. think the university that, I mean, we definitely like, there's a lot of younger people that move to Jackson for skiing or for, you know, the summer activities. But I would say that a lot of them don't want to be tied down. Those types of, don't want to be tied down to, a, you know, to a job. They'd rather work nights where they can ski during the day, where they can do different activities during the day and then work a restaurant job or whatever it might be. So um, we have had some inquiries around that, but that doesn't tend to stick for what we're looking for. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, of course, with the school bus driver shortage you mentioned, um, one of the things that stood out to me is your superintendent when nominating you, she mentioned that you started a walking school bus route. So, what does that kind of entail? You know, how do you have staff for that? Walk me through that a little bit. Yeah. So that um, that was actually started by my predecessor like a year or two before I came on. But I know I know everything about that and I can speak to that. The origin of the walking school bus, which essentially is just an a school district employee adult led walk um, in you know, our state calls them no transportation zones. It's about a mile radius from the school. Um, our state will not pay us, reimburse us for transportation in those zones. So um, as our state a couple of years ago, I guess it was seven, eight, seven or eight years ago, uh, was really seeking to tighten down on and, and be stricter on those walk zones. Obviously, local school districts uh, ran into a big challenge with school boards, families, parents who weren't having it. You know, anything from, well, do you expect my kindergartner to walk a mile in the cold every day? Um, you know, and those those types of concerns, which are legitimate. Um, so, Ed Allum, our former director, um, got this idea from um, a program in Colorado, I believe. I think it was the Safe Routes for School in Colorado or something like that. Um, and essentially, the goal of it was initially was to transition families from having a bus um, to, you know, having their kids get to school um, and, and sort of to have the district provide that cushion, that transition. I know one of the goals was really to show parents, hey, this is actually doable. 
this has actually been official for your kids. Um, there's a lot of studies uh, that have shown, you know, kids who get a little bit of exercise, get moving in the morning, tend to do better in class, to do better in school. And also, obviously, it was, it, the desire was to be compliant with our state. And so, that really took off. And so much so that our, our, our state actually rewrote um, the language and in, in one of their re- the transportation chapter um, to include walking school bus staff as a, as a reimbursable and approved staff. Um, so we, we actually used um, a, a gentleman who was a bus driver for us, I want to say for 30 some years, retired, and he's now walking with his wife and they, and they do two little routes in, uh, in downtown Jackson. Um, and they, they love it. The kids love it. Uh, the parents have gotten on board and some of them have even helped a little bit. And uh, so it's, it's gone really well. The community has really embraced it. They love it. Yeah. And I know it gets pretty cold uh, in Wyoming and in Jackson Hole. So those routes are still, they're still walking. It, it is cold and they are still walking. Yeah. Um, you know, I think our coldest day that we had school last year, and this was the coldest day we've had in a while, was negative 26 I believe. Oh my gosh. And that was at 4 a.m. But still, it doesn't get much warmer <laughs> it's at, when it's time to walk to school. But I'll tell you what, I mean, I've got kids of my own. Um, it, I mean, you'd be amazed. I mean, the kids, um, they, they wear their big five, they call it, and they're really unfazed. I mean, it, it almost seems like many of the parents are, are, are more upset than the kids are. And the kids just, <laughs> it, and I think it's just a way of life for the kids that grow up here and live here. They love playing in the snow. Most, I mean, you ask most kids around here, what's your favorite season? They're going to tell you it's winter. And so, you know, they're outside playing, outside sledding, outside skiing, whatever it might be. And so, um, that we, that we haven't found the weather to be a significant barrier. Do we have less walkers on a negative 26 degree day? Yeah, probably. I'm, I'm sure some of their parents probably drove them to school, but Russ and Yvonne are two um, staff members taking on that. They're still out there, you know, and it's, oh, it's awesome. Um, it's been really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I, I'm sure that does boost community morale and having, you know, these, a, a past driver, you know, kind of lead that initiative. So that's really cool to hear. Yeah, it's, it's worked out really well. So kind of switching gears a little bit, but we're actually filming on the same day that the FCC granted school bus Wi-Fi now as available funding under E-rate, mm. which is huge news for the industry. I know this is something that has been trying to be pushed for a while, so very exciting. Um, and we were kind of talking before that you have some Wi-Fi on your school buses. So do you kind of want to talk about that a little bit? You know, how far are these routes going and and what has your experience been using, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots on buses? Yeah, for sure. No, that is exciting news. We've uh, we've been paying out of pocket as a district for um, the Wi-Fi that we do have. Um, our, a lot of our routes, Jackson's a pretty small town, so a lot of our routes are shorter um, and we, we haven't really, like home to school type routes, we haven't really needed Wi-Fi up to this point. Um, however, we do um, just the nature of Wyoming. Uh, our, our districts are pretty spread out, um, and so sports and activities travel is anywhere from an hour and a half in the bus up to, in extreme cases, seven and a half hour drive to Cheyenne. So we have equipped all of our we call them activity style buses with with Wi-Fi that um, you know students and 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 coaches, um, and even drivers when they're there can, can use and access to do homework. And, and that has, um, you know, that has been, I think received well. Mm -hmm. And so maybe would you consider it for your other buses, you know, now that there's funding available, or do you think maybe it's not applicable just because of the, the shorter routes for your home to school? I mean, now that there's funding available, we would, we would certainly consider it. Yeah. I mean, because Mm -hmm. we still have, kids, especially like middle school, high school kids on the bus, you know, for upwards of 30 to 50 minutes. Um, and I think, you know, if they can get their work done while they're you know on their way home instead of when they get home, I mean, I think that that makes a great use of, of the bus ride. So, that's definitely something to consider. Mm-hmm. Yeah, big news definitely coming out of the FCC on that. So, excited to see where that kind of goes and how districts are able to utilize that funding. 
Absolutely. Thanks for telling me about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, you know, expanding to more technology. I know one of your goals kind of going forward was looking at more technology options and kind of embracing more at your school district. So are there any, you know, technologies that you guys are looking at particularly or anything that's on your wish list of items? Yeah, quite, quite a bit. Um, I would say that um, we have had processes and procedures in place that have worked well, um, but they're just a bit outdated. Um, we still are pretty heavily reliant on paper. We do utilize um, like a student tracking through Zonar. We do have a student routing software that we're happy with that we're using. And so we have a database and information and ways to communicate with parents and all of that is at our fingertips. Um, but on the driver side, uh, we're still using route sheets that are made in Google Docs. You know, we're using um, rosters that are sort of a generated report from our routing software, paper rosters. Um, you know, we have uh, paper field trip and activity trip data sheets, you know, all, all the rest, pre-trip inspections, all that. So, we're, we're currently piloting a program that would also integrate with our routing software that would essentially... Um, you know, we'll see, but it, it would essentially uh, solve all of those things and put all of those things digitally. The biggest hesitation I've had up until this point has been um, just the having the bandwidth to take on something like this to make sure that it's done well, to make sure that it doesn't cause more issues um, than it solves. You know, and so I think we're at that point as a department where we're ready to to sort of try that next step. So we're piloting it. On, on five buses right now. And I mean, we're still getting them set up. So I wish I could tell you how it's going. Um, it's just going slow as everything goes. So, mm -hmm. And that's tablets? Yes, tablets. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you mentioned having the drivers use them for pre and post trip inspections. And then would that be turn by turn directions on the tablets? Yep. So it would be uh, pre trip, post trip, uh, turn by turn directions. It would integrate with the student tracking um, with our routing software and database. And so you, drivers would be able to see more in real time, you know, hey, Johnny Smith does or does not have authorization to get on your bus mm -hmm. and, you know, relevant communications, notes, that kind of thing. It, it it promises to do all of that. So with that technology and, and getting the tablets on the school buses, you know, how have your drivers been accepting that? Is there any pushback or is it with a certain drivers right now just piloting it? Yeah, you know, that's that's a good question. That's kind of part of why we're piloting. We try to choose a, um, a bunch of different types of drivers, um, you know, maybe drivers who are going to be like, oh, yeah, no sweat, no problem. Give us great feedback. Drivers who aren't going to like it um, and all the rest. And so we'll, we'll see. You know, we'll, we'll see. We haven't, everyone so far has agreed to try it. And um, hopefully, you know, the goal is that it, it makes their lives easier as well as ours. Yeah. We'll have to check back in and see how the pilot's going and see if you have any updates, you know, going forward. Yeah. Hopefully I'll have some good updates for you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Colby. Thanks for jumping on the podcast. I really appreciate it. You know, thanks for sharing your knowledge with the nation and congratulations on being a rising star. Thank you guys uh, so much. It's a privilege to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And, you know, with Rising Stars now, um, we're giving, you know, conference registration to one of our expos or TSD. So hopefully we'll see you out there at uh, one of the shows next year. Yep. Would, would love to make it. Hopefully see you there. Guys, it was an excellent episode. We're so glad you came on. So many great conversations. Special thanks to Colby, Stephen Whaley at the Propane Education Research Council, Daniel Hernandez as Adroit, Ryan Gray, Taylor Equitani. My goodness, it was a it was a busy episode. We had a good one. So thanks to our sponsors, Transfinder, Perk, and Adroit for all supporting the podcast. We appreciate you guys. Make sure you reach out to those sponsors. Tell them you heard them on the STN podcast. Don't forget, you can get all the great information on stnonline.com, the latest updates on news and happenings in the school transportation industry. We also got that TSD conference coming up so soon, November 15th through the 20th. If you haven't signed up, you still have an opportunity. Registration closes on October 27th. Be 
sure to go to tsdconference.com, get locked in, check out that daily agenda. So many important topics, so much special needs training. It is the ultimate in special needs training. You guys got to come and partake. If you have anyone in your organization that could benefit from that, please send them. This is your chance before the end of the year to take advantage of that. We'd love to see it in Frisco, Texas. That's a suburb of Dallas. Guys, we love you. Nation, it's a great time. Enjoy your day. We'll see you next week.